thank you to the Edinburgh School uh, and everyone here for inviting me. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here. So I want to talk a little bit about three people's theories uh, that have been very influential for me. Raymond Williams, Herbert Marcuse uh, and Dallas Smythe and how this relates uh, to uh, a critical understanding of social media. If you want to tweet about this talk, then I suggest the hashtag social media. Uh, and as Klaus already mentioned, this, it, it's somehow a coincidence that this book was published yesterday. I got two copies uh, just yesterday, Culture and Economy in the Age of Social Media. And in this, uh, so you could say it's a kind of book launch also, because for this book, these three thinkers uh, are really the, the, the theoretical foundation, uh, you could say. And what I would like to do is I think I, I have two copies thus far. I will donate one to the Edinburgh School library, so you have the very first copy that was uh, printed, and we can also circulate it, and you can have uh, a look, and if it's in the library, then uh, whoever has an interest in it uh, can also have uh, a look at it. And we can circulate the second copy here, and maybe give, uh, I can get, and maybe I can get one copy back afterwards. So that's my structure, but I don't explain my structure, it's fairly straight uh, forward. So these three thinkers, I mean, what they have in common is that they are all uh, uh, representatives uh, of critical studies of media, communications, uh, and culture. Yeah, the central, some of their central concepts for Raymond Williams were, for example, the whole culture is a whole way of life or the structure of feeling. Herbert Marcuse uh, talked about uh, one-dimensional man and thought and technological rationality and Taylor Smythe about audience labor and audience commodity. And I want to set them into a theoretical conversation somehow and explore links to, for, to a critical understanding uh, of what we nowadays call uh, social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and uh, so on. The interesting thing is that they are really hard, I checked this up, they are hardly cross-references uh, between the works between uh, these three uh, authors. Although you could say all three of them are representatives of Marxist studies of media uh, and culture. However, one reference that I found is in Dallas Smythe's uh, well-known paper, uh, Communications, Blind Spot of Western Marxism, uh, where he dismisses the work uh, of Raymond Williams, uh, Herbert Marcuse, and a lot of other critical uh, scholars, because Smythe was in the late 70s, he was very uh, displeased uh, with the way uh, media and communications were studied. And he was saying that a lot of approaches are very are idealist theories uh, that fo of communications that focus on communication content and its ideological uh, framing uh, of dominative society. And there he says uh, that uh, part of these idealist theories are also Marcuse, as you can see here, uh, and also Raymond uh, uh, Williams. And he says none of them addresses the consciousness industry uh, as an economic process uh, where advertising uh, plays a role. So he was interested in what is constitutive uh, for the political economy uh, of advertising and was specifically talking about advertising financed uh, media. However, I think that, uh, that I think Smythe is actually wrong to dismiss uh, Herbert Marcuse and uh, Raymond Williams because I think there are much more connections between their approaches than one uh, would uh, think. So it's a kind of polarized uh, interpretation, the, the way he presents it, that on the one hand you have people who study political economy with, uh, in the commodity form uh, and issues of class, and on the other hand people who do ideo uh, ideology critique. However, and of course Marcuse is a representative of the Frankfurt School together with others, but in the Frankfurt School uh, it's sometimes Sometimes they may be seen as a kind of representatives of an ideology critique of the media and culture. But also in the Frankfurt School you had political economists uh, doing studies of what they back then called late capitalism or monopoly capitalism. People like Friedrich Pollock, George Friedman uh, or Henrik Grossmann. Uh, so they were really studying uh, the economic structures uh, of uh, contemporary society and how it relates to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to culture. On the other hand, 
In Smythe's work itself, it's not just about audience labor and audience commodification. There is also a kind of ideology critique in it because he talks about, he introduced the notion of the consciousness industry, which he took from Hans Magnus Enzensberger, but he gave a different twist to it because he was rather critical of, uh, of Enzensberger. And he said that ideology within a capitalist society tends to promote uh, the values that favor capitalism and the private property uh, system with fetishist assumptions like uh, human nature is necessarily selfish uh, and possessive and so on. So if we look for it, then we also find this idea of ideology critique in Smythe uh, itself. So I think uh, we should uh, strive for pointing out the connections between also today between different forms of critical studies of media uh, and, com and, and, com and, and communications. And in, in the British School of Political Economy of Communication, Graham Murdoch and Peter Golding have right from the start pointed out uh, that the critique of the commodity form and the critique of ideology belongs together. And I will start with... Raymond Williams, and there's one specific element that I'm interested, especially interested in Raymond Williams, which is his uh, approach of cultural uh, materialism. Uh, and I mean, of course, it's well known how he talks about culture as a whole way of life. Throughout, it's, it's, uh, uh, the analysis of culture runs throughout his whole studies. Uh, but the idea of cultural materialism and also how it relates to cultural work uh, was something that was a little bit later developed. So in his earlier works, like Culture and Society, there's not so much focus on the question of cultural work. Whereas in the 1977 book, Marxism and Literature, uh, that's really where he grounds this approach uh, of cultural materialism. Some people, like Jim McWiggan, who just uh, published a book about Raymond Williams, or two books, uh, they argue that actually this book should be called Marxism and Culture, because it's not just about literature. Yeah? So you could really, uh, it's, it's not a, well, a very well chosen uh, title. But what Williams does in this uh, book is that he, uh, he formulates a critique of the way people conceptualize to have conceptualized the relationship between economy uh, and culture. And he says, if you look at cultural theory and critical cultural theorists, then a lot of them assume there's economy on the one side and culture on the other side. And then they assume some form of mediate, mediation, determination of re and reflection, some kind of causal determination in different forms. But he says the problem of these approaches really is that they somehow culture and economy, they, although they might be connected in these approaches, they nonetheless, they remain separate somehow. Yeah? So it's like base and superstructure, economy uh, and culture. And Williams questioned in the first instance, really, that we separate and think of culture and economy uh, as two different uh, things. And I think that's an idea that we can take uh, from him. So somehow he said, these materialist theories of culture are not materialist enough. Somehow they separate uh, culture and economy and are quite dualist uh, in their uh, approach, it's not dialectical enough, uh, you, could, uh, you could say. Sum and Chesop have just written a book about what they call cultural political economy. Uh, well, and they argue that Williams' work is, could be seen in, in this stage uh, as a kind of return to the marks of the German ideology, where he also formulated uh, similar ideas. And I would agree with this. Uh, and uh, a, a, this connection to Marx is quite explicit uh, in Williams' uh, work. For example, he wrote an essay called Marx on Culture, which is a very thorough study, really, of the meanings of the sentences that Marx wrote in the German ideology uh, about uh, this relationship of culture and, uh, and uh, economy. So for Raymond Williams, culture and materialism sees the complex unity uh, of culture and economy, of different elements that somehow belong together. And he argues culture is not just ideas. Yeah? Ideas are material in themselves, and they have a social and material reality. So that's cultural materialism. What can we make of this idea today? Why does it matter, really? I think it matters because in cultural theory, what I'm observing is that there's, again, a kind of more dualistic approach, yeah, where people separate things, where they separate, for example, uh, the role of technology on the one hand and the role of, uh, of, of cultural content on the other hand, when they define specific terms like cultural work or the cultural industries. Yeah? It's for example a question, which industries belong to the, to, the, uh, to the cultural industries and which ones do not belong there? Does something like hardware production belong there uh, or not? 
Yeah, I would say yes. A lot of people say no. That's not really culture. Yeah, uh, and a lot of other questions. I mean, but I think what we are seeing today is actually that boundaries between dualities uh, seem to blur between the workplace, and that has to do with the changes of modern society and uh, capitalism uh, and everyday life. Yeah? Change, the boundaries between things like workplace, the home, the private and the public, labor time and leisure time, play and labor, so the bound, and a lot of other things. The boundaries between these categories become more fluid, yeah? which is just a phenomenon in itself. Uh, it does not automatically have positive or negative consequences. However, as I will try to show a, 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 a bit uh, later, uh, in the world of uh, working uh, uh, life, this is connected to changes of the economy towards a kind of neoliberal uh, governmentality. But how we can now use Williams for thinking about culture and economy uh, is that we take a dialectical approach and in, really in, in a Hegelian way, which means that if you have two things that uh, stand in a relationship, then in a kind of paradoxical manner, if it's dialectical, they are the same and different at the same time. So they are exactly the same, identical, but different at the same time. How does this strange idea help us for understanding the relationship of economy uh, and uh, culture? So I think, the, I think culture is not the same as the economy, but the, see, there must be one part of the economy that is also part of culture. But then culture also goes beyond the economy and has emergent qualities so that the sum of uh, of uh, culture is more than its parts and has qualities that go beyond just an economic uh, re reality. So this idea of emergent qualities that you can connect to system theory and self-organization theory is something that uh, Raymond Williams in the 1970s uh, formulated as the idea of emergent culture. Yeah? Although he did not know anything about system theory, uh, really. So, And if we now talk about work and cultural work, then I think that of course, there is, there is physical world, uh, work in the world which produces physical goods that we can touch uh, and feel. Uh, and I think a part of physical work is what we could term physical cultural work that produces information technologies, yeah? mobile phones, laptops, cameras, uh, and uh, so on, which is a necessary physical infrastructure. But based on these technologies, People appropriate these technologies and use them in other work processes where they create information, knowledge, uh, and the cultural content. I would say that's information work, but both things uh, belong uh, to uh, to together. Uh, physical uh, inf uh, uh, cultural work and information uh, 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 work. Uh, so you could say, that's an example that Marx uses, uh, that the piano player, for playing the piano, you first need the piano maker. You need a composer composing uh, uh, a song, and you need the piano player. Uh, without the piano, and without the physical cultural work of the piano maker, there could not be any form of culture and music uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, at, at all. Uh, and uh, the composer and the piano player, uh, they are the informational worker, uh, workers here. Yeah? But I think these things belong together, and all of this together forms the cultural work uh, process, although there are, of course, uh, differences. Della Smythe. Uh, so his main category uh, in his work in the political economy of communication is this idea of audience labor and audience uh, commodification. And what he was really interested in is what the commodity form of commercial advertising financed media is all about, which is an important question because uh, how Marx started his analysis of capital, uh, capitalism in Capital Volume 1 is with this sentence that the wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails is an immense collection of commodities. So when we want to analyze political economy, uh, we always have to start with asking what is the commodity? And Smyth was asking himself what is the commodity in advertising funded media that have become ever more important uh, with the rise of mass culture and mass uh, production and mass consumption in the uh, 20th uh, century, and he wanted to find an answer to this question. And the answer that he found was, well, it looks like that, uh, that uh, in advertising-funded media, the audiences produce uh, attention as a commodity that is sold to advertising clients. And therefore, uh, he introduced these ideas of unpaid audiences as a workforce who produce 
attention as a commodity that is sold to advertising clients. So that's, I think, his basic uh, idea in this political economy uh, of advertising, uh, of advertising financed media. One must also see that uh, it was formulated as a criticism uh, of Baran and Sweezy's monopoly capitalism uh, approach because they also conceptualized the role of advertising uh, in the modern uh, economy. But in Smythe's approach, uh, uh, opinion, uh, they did not go far enough. And that in his opinion, they reduced advertising to an unproductive attribute uh, of uh, monopoly, uh, so that labor di and uh, uh, labor processes did not play an important role in the analysis uh, of, uh, of advertising, but that the notion of monopoly was foregrounded. Uh, so this is how what companies in the capitalist economy are doing. Yeah? So they invest money, M, and then they buy commodities, C, labor power, and means of production, then there's a production process, P, where a new commodity, uh, a good that is being sold on the market, C prime, emerges that is then being sold on the market, on the market so that a profit emerges. So M prime is the invested initial capital plus a profit and parts of it is reinvested. So it's a very dynamic uh, process of capital accumulation. Now, uh, if you want to connect this idea, which comes from Marx, basically, yeah, uh, as the analysis of the political economy of capitalism, to tell us Smythe, then we can nowadays connect it to the question of how do advertising-funded social media, like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, Baidu, uh, and others, uh, Weibo, uh, because their business model is advertising, targeted advertising, how does this process work there? Then I think we have to reformulate it. Uh, it becomes a little bit more complex because there is a product is being produced first, the platform, when you log into Facebook and Twitter. But it's, this is not a commodity. It's not sold on the market. You don't pay for it. You get free access to it. So based on Taylor Smith, we can then say, the commodity is something else. And wherever there is a commodity, there must be labor that produces the commodity and its value. And so what I'm claiming is that the unpaid work of the users, or what has to become to be known in, uh, in the political economy of the internet, is the notion of digital labor. Uh, this digital labor of the, all the, the usage time uh, of the users of co corporate social media platforms that are advertising funded produces a data commodity, data as a commodity that is then sold to advertising uh, clients. So it's digital labor producing uh, a data commodity and commodification plays an immense uh, role here. And we should not be mistaken, Facebook, uh, Google, uh, Twitter, uh, and also the Chinese platforms, uh, Weibo, Baidu, and so on, they are not communications companies uh, because they don't sell communications. They are the largest advertising agencies in the world. So it's all about adver advertising and consumer culture, really. Maybe I'll, I'll skip over this. But the notion of digital labor, uh, it would be idealist in Smythe's sense if we would only focus on digital labor as the production of data on the internet. Because remember, like when I now put Taylor Smith and Raymond Williams into a dialogue, then what Raymond Williams tells us is, well, the production of content, and data is also a kind of content, even if it's metadata, meta it depends on the physical infrastructure. So we could not use Facebook uh, and Google uh, and uh, Baidu and other platforms without our mobile phones, without our laptops, without a hardware infra infrastructure, without servers and so on, which is something a very physical uh, infrastructure. Yeah? And of course, the, this whole physical infrastructure also has ecological implications because it consumes a lot of energy. And how, for how long do you have your mobile phones or your laptops? Yeah? Two years, three years maximum. Yeah? Then it's being dumped as e-waste back into nature and exported into developing countries to a certain extent. So these are very physical aspects. So digital labor, and there is work involved there also in producing this, uh, th th these uh, goods. So digital labor is also a broader notion that encompasses other forms of, of, uh, of work. And this is just a brief summary of different chapters I have written for the digital labor and Karl Marx book, which is another book, uh, that looks really at different forms of digital Digital labor. So on the one hand, uh, there are minerals that are being extracted, mainly in Africa, uh, for example, in the Democratic uh, Republic of, Cong of Congo, that are the, the physical foundation of our information and communication technologies. And uh, in the Congo, 
uh, a lot of this la uh, labor is slave labor. Uh, then there uh, is the manufacturing of components uh, into the final tools. A lot of it takes uh, mobile phones, laptops, uh, and other hardware. A lot of it takes place uh, in China. The, uh, uh, the, 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 the the suicides of young workers at Foxconn uh, have be also in the Western world become uh, quite uh, well uh, known, which shows uh, which prob the problematic working conditions are based there. Then you uh, have what you could call the labor aristocracy, people who work, for example, in the Googleplex. Yeah? It's a very different kind of, of digital work, really. Yeah? These are people who have very high wages, uh, very little free time, uh, and uh, are hi they are, so they are highly... Uh, stressed and highly paid at the same time. But then you have, for example, also software engineers who work in, uh, in countries like India, who on average earn maybe 10% of the wage uh, from a software engineer uh, in, in, in the West. So it tells us something about the whole globalization of cultural uh, and, di and digital work and that there are transnational companies involved that outsource labor also. Then there is audience and user labor yeah, that uh, creates the attention and the data in ad targeted advertising funded business models. But of course there are a lot of other business models. So different forms of other digital forms of labor that produce different forms of content are also uh, involved there. So for for example, uh, there are, uh, what, what I think what is very important in the contemporary econo economy, unfortunately, uh, is, uh, uh, is precarious uh, 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 work, freelance uh, work. Uh, I think in the, I saw statistics that in the United States, about one third of all employees uh, are freelancers. And, and I, all other statistics show that in the US and also uh, in, in Britain, the largest share of freelancers works in the digital media and cultural uh, in the, uh, in the industries. And now platforms have em uh, emerged like Amazon, Mechanical Turk, Elance, Odesk, and others, where these freelancers are looking uh, for, for, for work and are partly very lowly, uh, only receive very low remuneration. So all of this is digital labor together. And we, if we employ this idea by Raymond Williams, then we must see uh, how it, they are different, different forms of labor, but connected at the same uh, time. And also, I mean, if you think of this in terms of Mark, Marxist theory, then Marx talk, talks of modes of production and he identifies different ones, like capitalism is just one of them, yeah? but there are also other ones like patriarchy, which is the oldest one, yeah? where there's gender-based exploitation of, uh, of labor. That's, patriarchy is not something of the past. Yeah? It really continues to exist because if we look at working con uh, con con conditions, then uh, women uh, tend to be those who are worst off. Yeah? Uh, even, even in highly paid ICT jobs, uh, women tend to have lower, lower, uh, low, lower salaries. And even in, in, in the slave works, women are not, in, in, Afri in, in, in Congo and so on, women are not just uh, being threatened like the men uh, that, uh, that they are killed if they don't go into the mine and extract the minerals. They are also raped and so on. Yeah? Uh, and so, and so, and so, but so patriarchy is connected to slavery uh, also. And also, there are idea, there are, uh, there are feudalism is still around, and uh, the notion of rent somehow still uh, matters here. But I cannot go into the details uh, here. And then, when we talk about cultural information and digital work, it also looks like the different modes of the organization of the productive, what Marx called the productive forces, are combined here. So, if you think of the, of 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 the miners, that's my kind of uh, really representative of, of the agricultural uh, form uh, of, uh, of work. Then you have uh, the, the hardware assemblers, which is a classical industrial form of work. And then you have more uh, the, what in a narrow sense some people understand as cultural uh, work, which uh, probably is the work that has become more, uh, more important in what we nowadays call the information society and the in information economy. But there's an, inter, an interplay of all of these forms uh, of work and the, uh, these or organizations modes of the economy. Herbert Marcuse, how can we bring him uh, into uh, play? Uh, one idea of Marcuse uh, was that uh, there is a dialectic not just of objective uh, reality or of subjective reality, but a dialectic of dialectic, a meta-dialectic, which sounds very complex now, but uh, in Marxist philosophy there are approaches that could be, that see dialectics as an objectivist notion. So dialectics is in the contradictions and antagonisms of the capitalist economy and society in itself. 
which, as Marx says, results in, the, in crisis tendencies. And we are still in a, uh, in a, in a prolonged uh, world economic uh, crisis. So this has to do with objective contradictions between use value and exchange value and so on. And then the subjective dialectic has, has to do with social movements, protests, social struggles, so that the, the, the contradictions are something that are being lived out in, uh, in reality and where hegemony uh, is being questioned uh, by collective political uh, organizations. And somehow these forms of two forms of dialectics are somehow separated again somehow. Marcuse has thought them together really, and I think that's one of his, uh, his uh, strengths really in his uh, philo uh, phil philosophy. And uh, I found this very important of coming up with my own idea of and concept of the, of the, of the dialectic. So somehow Marcuse says in dominative and class societies there are antagonisms yeah? uh, that's, uh, that are objectively built into the structure of society. An antagonism is what, well, what, what, what Hegel calls an, the, the negativity uh, of uh, society. But this the idea that, the that something new can emerge from a crisis, from an antagonism, it's not something automatically, but in a situation of crisis, there is a potential for changing reality. We are now in such a, a bifurcation, a phase transition of society and the economy, really, where things could remain the same, they could change towards the better, or they could change towards the worse. Yeah? So what Marcuse then wants to tell us is that the negation of the negativity of society can only be done by, uh, by, 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 by human beings when they collectively organize, in self-organizing processes where they organize uh, as uh, social uh, movements. And if they do so, then there's not guaranteed that they, that, that they are successful or that they, uh, that they can come up with, a, with, as the result of their social struggles, with a better framework for society. So there's uncertainty also. And this, how does this idea of the dialectic relate to, uh, to, uh, to an understanding uh, of uh, social media? On the one hand, I think there are several dimensions where we can under, uh, employ a dialectical philosophical understanding. On the one hand, a dialectic of subject and object. So the internet, and social media, digital media, these are not just structures. The internet is not just a, a, a technological network of computer networks. What makes them uh, alive uh, is really the communication processes and the human uh, activities. So it's social networks on a subjective level uh, interacting in a dialectical uh, manner with global networks uh, of computer networks as a technological uh, structure. If we think about social media, I mean, it's a kind of strange term because in a sense, as all media are really uh, social. Even if I sit alone at home, I'm not connected to the internet and I write uh, a document, uh, I'm referring to other ideas. Maybe I'm reading some books and the book is also uh, an artifact that uh, brings a, a different social context into my reality. But how we understand social media now is that these are newer forms of platforms that on, on the, based on the World Wide Web and the internet that enable social relationships, sharing, communication, collaboration, uh, and uh, community. So the, the, the uh, productive, the communicative productive forces seem to become more social. But at the same time, there's something very individualistic and narcissistic about social media, a logic of individualism that they also put forward. Yeah? So they are perfect tools for individual self-presentation, for competition between uh, human uh, beings, who has more friends uh, on uh, Facebook, uh, who has more followers uh, on uh, Twitter. It's also about power uh, then, and it's about the idea of an individual accumulation of reputation uh, and uh, context. So that's also a contradiction of, 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 of social media. And how these platforms are only called is something, it's called YouTube, not our tube. It's called MySpace, not collective space. And on Facebook, you show your individual face. You don't show the face of an entire group, yeah, like we are here in a, in a room. Uh, skipping over this dialectic. Uh, then there's also a dialectic of chance and necessity. So the idea that Marcuse somehow had is that, in, that when there are antagonisms, again and again we enter situations of crisis. And that uh, and it's, it, the, the deterministic aspect somehow is, as long as there are antagonisms, it is very likely that uh, crisis is unavoidable. Yeah? Also in the capitalist economy, it's a history of crisis uh, that goes back hundreds uh, of years. What is not determined is 
when the crisis will set in, and given that uh, the, in the history of the internet since the 1990s is also a history of the commercialization of the internet, the whole internet economy again and again has to deal with financial crisis and other forms of crisis like the 2000 dot com uh, cri crisis emanating from the objective contradictions. I mean, that's the contradiction uh, between uh, between uh, the, the values that are being achieved in the, in the, in the real economy uh, via profits uh, and the financial market uh, values. So it could be that in our current advertising funded, highly financialized social media uh, world, uh, a kind of financial bubble is building up that at some point of time may explode. And then this may be the end uh, of Twitter, Facebook, Google, uh, and uh, others. So don't take it for granted that they will exist uh, for, uh, forever, but it's not determined that the crisis, uh, that, that I think if a financial bubble is building up. If it explodes, we don't know. If it explodes, then the question will arise, how do we organize the internet? Yeah? Are there alternative modes of production? And at the same time, I mean, the contradictions of social media uh, also result in a lot of critiques of, uh, of social media. People feel that their private privacy is being uh, vi uh, violated. They don't like the complex terms of, terms of use, which are all phenomena that somehow advance the commodification of data, which is really the underlying uh, prob uh, 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 problem. So if all of this results really in a big crisis, then there's the, an element of chance, where chance can also be empowering and where the question arises, well, can we do it differently, really? Yeah? Can we have a better uh, internet and different forms of social me uh, media. Mm, another idea by Marcuse is uh, the idea uh, uh, in er the book Eros and Civilization that uh, the political economy is connected to structures of drives and he distinguishes between uh, the, the pleasure drive called Eros and the death drive uh, called Thanatos and he argues that well, what people would really like to do is to have a lot of free time uh, for pleasure. But in order to organize a society, uh, there must be a specific form of work organized in, uh, in, uh, in society, which is sometimes more pain than, uh, than, than, uh, than, uh, than, it, than, it, than its pleasure. So he says there's a necessary repression of eros and of pleasure in order to, to make culture and society possible. He, however, says that in a class-based society, there is what he calls the performance principle and surplus repression uh, of, the, uh, of the pleasure uh, print, uh, principle so that profit can, uh, can uh, can, Im can uh, emerge, there is an additional uh, repression uh, of uh, a pleasure that is somehow unnecessary, but at the same time, at the level of political economy, uh, enables the uh, existence uh, of uh, economic profits uh, of uh, companies. This, is, this idea was pretty much something for the stage of Fordist capitalism as we knew it uh, during, uh, the, uh, the, during the, the the first three-fourths uh, of the 20th century, where there was a rather a clear separation between leisure time uh, and work time, yeah? where you were doing your, your, your job, maybe you liked it, a lot of, or you did not like it, uh, and then leisure time, well, this was the area of, of recreation, recreation uh, pleasure, uh, and so on. Nowadays, it's much harder to separate work time uh, and, uh, and leisure time. Think of something like the Googleplex, which is not just the workspace, it's a playground, yeah? it's entertainment, it's restaurants. The idea behind this is also, if people spend more time there, then they will spend part of their, their leisure time there, but they will also work more, more, more hours than uh, in addition. So pleasure and pain, leisure and work time becomes indiscernible, which on the level of the structures of drives that Marcuse was analyzing, then uh, also means uh, that uh, this concept uh, of the performance principle and of surplus repression is not just in the working time, but enters in a, uh, in, 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 in a flexibilized uh, capitalist economy, enters the whole realm of leisure time uh, uh, also. It means that a lot of our leisure times, time also be, uh, becomes work time and becomes commodified uh, time uh, where we produce commodities uh, for, uh, for companies. And then in Marcuse also ideology critique uh, is important via the idea of technological rationality which corresponds to Horkheimer and Adorno's idea of instrumental rationality where the idea is that in dominative and in class societies people are being instrumentalized somehow. Yeah? They are turned into an instrument. 
It's a form of dehumanization, a form of alienation. And I think the idea that we can now, if we set Herbert Marcuse into a conversation with Smythe and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and Raymond Williams, then uh, we, labor and ideology should not be separated. And somehow in cultural theory and cultural analysis, they are separated somehow. There are those people who analyze working conditions, for example, labor studies, they don't talk a lot about ideology sometimes. Yeah? And then there are critical discourse analy analysis who analyze texts, but they don't think about the conditions under which texts, discourses, and ideologies are being produced. So if you look, uh, uh, if you look in some, I looked in one of the main books by Norman Fairclough and was looking, who's analyzing ideologies and discourses, and was looking for the term labor. It was only coming up two times uh, when he talks about the ideologies of new labor, yeah? like t under Tony Blair and so on. But I feel, I mean, basing an analysis of cult on cultural materialism then means ideology and labor are not separate because there are, on the one hand, those who produce ideologies, it is also done in specific work processes. So there's ideological work. And uh, of course, this, uh, and the, the, uh, the ideologies can be challenged, but then it's also via human practices, what could be called critical uh, uh, critical work. So these are also work processes, and ideologies do not, and discourses do not exist separately from human beings who produce them uh, as part of economic uh, processes. So that's the basic idea we can here draw on. But relating it back to social media, we also find ideologies there that are being produced. So if you, these are just how the platforms under, present themselves. So for example, Facebook says, use our platform because we enable you, uh, we have the power you have to hear the power to share and to make the world more open and connected. Similar things can be found on YouTube, Google, Twitter. Uh, also in China, uh, the commercial social media platforms have quite a similar form of ideology. So for example, Sina Weibo uh, says that uh, it's a great platform because it allows users to connect, share information anywhere, anytime, and with anyone on our platform. So, I think the ideology here is that it's a kind of engaging, connecting, and sharing ideology. Whereby, when I'm saying it's an ideology, I do not mean that this is false consciousness. It's true, these platforms enable us to engage in a more sustained form of sociality. It enhances our sociality. But what I'm missing here is that it's just framed in positive terms. But in, if you think dialectically, then things might have uh, positive consequences and negative ones at the same, uh, at, uh, at the same time, yeah? because there's a kind of contradiction uh, between them. So these uh, so, uh, social media companies have quite a one-dimensional ideology, and that's where Marcuse come, comes in, that only focuses on the positive aspects, and is also technologically deterministic, because it says, now we have social media, and the world will become a better place, really. Also, it has a kind of I mean, the idea of liking things, yeah, you cannot, this is also an ideology, you cannot dislike things on Facebook, which results in paradox things like this. Uh, the thing you see down there is a screenshot uh, from the Auschwitz Memorial's uh, Facebook uh, page where they describe, like, uh, for commemoration, uh, what horrible things happened there, actually, yeah. So, 1943, where uh, a lot of Jewish people were deported uh, to Auschwitz and, and, and killed there. Well, 171 people like it. Yeah, maybe we would want to express different expressions that uh, we find it shocking that this happens. Yeah, but Facebook does not enable us to do it really. Yeah, you can just like things. Yeah, so it's also truncated somehow and one uh, dimensional. Then there's also the idea around that Facebook. Well that it cannot be a form of labor because it's fun and it's voluntary. Yeah? Uh, but I think what, when Marx describes ideology, he speaks of the fetishism of commodities. So for Marx, an ideology means uh, that if you, if you have a, see a commodity, you don't see the, the, the social relations under which the commodity was produced and that are underlying it. So think of an iPhone. It presents itself in advertisement as being colorful for young, urban, modern uh, people. That's how, how it's being advertised in advertisements. But what you don't see are the working conditions, the Foxconn workers uh, in, uh, in, in China, uh, their blood and sweat uh, that underlies the production of these, uh, of these uh, te technologies. So it's hidden behind the commodity form. Uh, that's how commodity fetishism works classically in political economy. In social media, 
uh, it's inversed. It takes on an inversed form, commodity fetishism. Because we don't, I mean, if you have an iPhone, you see the commodity that you buy. If you go on Facebook, you don't think about money and paying for something. You have to pay a lot of money to get the iPhone, yeah? and you see it on your, uh, on your bank account uh, every, every, every month. Well, we just log into Facebook. It does not look like that there is an economy at all. It's just free uh, access. So really, we cannot see the commodity form. It seems to be all about the social. The social is being foregrounded, and the commodity form labor processes, class pro uh, pro pro processes are hidden behind the idea of free access uh, and free, uh, free use. And I think that's so commodity form inverses uh, its, uh, it, it, uh, its, it, its, uh, its, uh, itself here. What can we conclude from it? Uh, so this idea that Marcuse has of technological rationality, uh, it has like two dimensions, one could say. On the one hand, on the uh, in the work process, uh, in a class-based society, technological rationality means that human beings, are, are their bodies and minds are turned into instruments for the production of surplus and uh, uh, value that they don't own themselves, but that is owned by others. On the level of ideas, ideologies, try to turn human thought into an instrument uh, and uh, to instill uh, certain dominative ideas, which does not mean that it's always successful because ideologies can be uh, resisted, but it's all, the problem may already lie uh, at, the, at the point of production uh, of ideologies. Uh, then in capitalist media, I think this notion of instrumentality comes in via consumer capitalism, where we are all of the time reduced to the, uh, to the idea that we should consume something, that we should buy something. Yeah? So when I turn on the, in my hotel here the television uh, in, in Philadelphia, then there, on every TV channel there's so much advertising. There's advertising everywhere. On, when I go to Facebook, there's advertising. Yeah? So the question is, when we are being addressed as consumers, then should, is it a good society that, that, where everywhere the idea of a shopping mall and of shopping and consumption and of commodities is present? Yeah? Because we are not just consumers, we are much more. Yeah? We are uh, citizens uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and then uh, the commodity form, whenever there is also a form of instrumentalization, I mean, and commodity form takes on different forms in, uh, in, in, in commercial uh, media, content can be a commodity, audiences can be a commodity, data can be a commodity, access can be a commodity, but whenever there's a commodity, there's some form of labor that is being instrumentalized for uh, profit purposes. And then, of course, media are also vehicles for disseminating ideologies uh, that try to, on a mental level, uh, to instrumentalize us. And I think this is also, I mean, both levels are also important for uh, the political economy uh, and the critical theory of social media because there are advertisements and cultural commodification that turn um, humans into instruments for economic profit making. And then there are also different forms of social media ideologies that are being produced uh, by certain uh, human uh, beings. And I think we can... Uh, from Raymond Williams, take the idea that culture and work, ideology and labor are not two separate realms uh, of society. They are both material and they both belong uh, together. So culture and ideology have an economy in themselves. There are cultural workers and ideological workers who produce culture and ideologies. Uh, which then relates also to Dallas Smythe's uh, idea that in advertising-funded uh, media, uh, there is this uh, idea of audience or digital uh, uh, labor, uh, and uh, there is also uh, ideology. And Herbert Marcuse, on the level of well, political economy, uh, he identified this idea of the performance principle and surplus repression uh, in labor that takes on a different form uh, today. And he talked a lot about the one-dimensionality uh, of, uh, of ideology. So in, in, in all of them, uh, we somehow have, uh, ha have, uh, the, have, the, have, have the label uh, of basis work processes and how they are being uh, organized. And there's a level of, of ideology. And it's not being separated. There's some kind of connection. Uh, between, uh, uh, between the two. And on social media, on the one hand, there's, the, uh, there's the, 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 the labor of the users, of the prosumers, you could say, but then there's also a kind of work that creates ideologies, the engaging, connecting, sharing ideologies. So there are people who produce these ideologies and who reproduce them also in different sets of work uh, processes. Uh, so there's user labor and ideological labor at the same time. There's a good book, I think it's the best and 
the only, it's the only good public relations book about social media that was written thus far. Uh, it's called Social Media is Bullshit by B.J. Mendelssohn. And he described, he worked for like 10 years in the internet PR and advertising industry. And that's his conclusion from it. He says what consultants, uh, online advertising consultants and cons advertising consultants in general do is that they produce what he calls bullshit. It's myth about the internet and the great things that the internet will result in more profits, more attention, and so on. But his underlying rationale is quite a political economic one that he, uh, and he's not a political economist, he's a comedian uh, and a consultant, yeah. Uh, but he says people, he calls them cyber hipsters, tech media, marketers, analysts, corporations, mainstream um, media, uh, uh, media, marketing gurus, uh, neoliberal journalists, and users who produce this ide ideology, they've just focused on the positive aspects of social media. Yeah? Why is there just this one dimension that it's all a great thing, we will have a better economy. Yeah? So uh, what he reminds of, uh, us of is that there might be downsides and negative aspects. And in a critical approach, we also want to think about this. And what would all of this be? I mean, where are the alternatives now? Yeah? So I think that, uh, that uh, if Raymond Williams, uh, Herbert Marcuse, uh, and uh, Taylor Smythe were alive today, I don't think that they would uh, be big fans of commercial social media. I think they would use it, yeah, uh, but they had a different perspective of how, on how society uh, and the media should be organized beyond capitalism. So the idea of some form of democratic socialism is important for all three of them. So, Raymond Williams said that uh, it's necessary to supersede capitalist society. Taylor Smythe was explicitly arguing for a Marxist theory of communications. Herbert Marcuse said that socialism is a society that terminates the struggle for uh, existence and where technological rationality and instrumentality comes to an end. So that life uh, is an end in itself and no longer a means uh, to another uh, end. Also, they talked about alternative media, all three of them. Yeah? Uh, for example, uh, Marcuse, uh, as part of the student movement and uh, in the new left in the 70s, uh, thought about counter-institutions that could challenge the dominant uh, institutions. And he also thought about uh, media as counter-institutions, like alternative media, citizens' media, uh, and so on. Uh, in Della Smythe, yeah, there is also, in, in, there's, for example, an article that he wrote when he was visiting China. It's called After Bicycles What? He was thinking about a different way of how to organize television, as, as a, not as a one-way system, but as a two-way system, which somehow is, I mean, you could say it's a kind of parallel to Enzensberger's idea of emancipatory media use and the ideas about alternative media and an alternative radio system uh, that uh, Benjamin and Brecht were developing in their media theories. There's a kind of parallel uh, also uh, here, and also Smythe cared about alternative media. And Raymond Williams, quite similar, also in the 70s, even in his television uh, book, he imagines a cable system of a different kind, a democratization uh, of, uh, of broadcasting, and says that alternative media are tools of the long revolution uh, that could end and have the potential uh, for participatory uh, democracy and an educated uh, democracy. So there is this idea in, uh, the question is, Social media and the internet, uh, these alternative decentralized uh, platforms that are non-commercial, where are they and uh, can they be uh, organized? And there are, such platforms are around. Yeah? If you just think of Wikipedia, it's the only uh, commons-based web platform that is under the top 100 platforms uh, worldwide uh, that are most accessed besides the BBC website. All others are commercial uh, and for uh, profit. But this idea of a non-profit internet that is not about the commodity, not about uh, profit, not about uh, advertising, I think that's uh, a way forward towards a, a more common space and the public service uh, internet. And it's my democratic vision uh, and, and, and hope for the future uh, of uh, the internet because I fear if uh, the uh, internet and digital media continues to exist in the way it does now as highly controlled systems, on the one hand economically controlled, but there's another topic that I did not touch upon, but I've conducted a lot of research about it, political control. Yeah? Think of Edward Snowden's revelations. So what exists really is a surveillance industrial complex where secret services uh, and governments spy on citizens uh, and users 
uh, and collaborate uh, with, uh, 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 with the social media and internet and communications uh, platforms. And then also private security companies uh, are, are, in, are, in, are, in, are involved. So that's the economic and political control of the internet is the real reality in many parts of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of, of the world. Yeah? I mean, my analysis is focused on Europe and North uh, America, but we, if you globalize the idea, then uh, you will find very few places where there is a, a, a very free and non-controlled uh, internet. But alternatives uh, exist, and I think yeah, that's my hope for the future, that uh, social movements uh, will intensify, uh, and uh, that we should support them, uh, that uh, try to work for a democratic uh, internet and, democra and social media that are truly social and go beyond the idea uh, of uh, instrumental rationality. Thank you. So you can invite anyone for questions. Yes. And it can be completely free. How much time do we have? Well, to uh, half an hour. Half an Some hour. folks may need to leave as we yeah. you know, now that we get one apart, but we can stay for half an hour. And do you want to like collect a couple of questions and then I answer or should I answer? Well, just yeah, whatever you'd like to do. All right. Who cool. yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, um, two questions. Uh, one. One is about ideology. I yeah. thought that's really a very important critique. Um, but the examples you gave about Facebook and the Chinese Weibo and how their ideologies or how their efforts to you know, inculcate a particular kind of ideology, I would like to hear a little more about how that works. Yeah. The process is, because we, I think we all agree that this is ideological. But uh, we want to know more about how this ideology works, actually. What kind of processes uh, are involved? Why would people accept this idea about you know, social, social uh, media as free, it's about sharing, it's about interacting? Why, why does it happen that people would accept if people do accept? So that, that is one question. Yeah. The other one is related. It also relates to conclusions you are drawing here and the kind of alternatives you talk about. Um, again, I think this is very nice picture, broad picture. But I would like to hear a little bit more uh, about specific, almost specifically, the conditions under which the kind of challenge against ideology <coughs> might be possible. Yes. So the first question about, I mean, why do people accept these ideolog uh, ideologies? I mean, my question would first be, do they really accept it? I mean, uh, for a long time we did not know um, much about it, and uh, it re required really empirical studies of the attitudes. Uh, of uh, the users and the studies that I conducted myself are in a European context, yeah? so I cannot tell you why users uh, in China uh, accept the neoliberal social media uh, ide ideology. I can observe with my own Chinese uh, students that they are very critical of the state control uh, of, uh, so of social media. But what we found, uh, I mean, in the studies that I did in, uh, in, in, in Europe, and it, for example, in Australia, it seems to look the same, uh, the same, the same because Mark Andreevich did some uh, studies uh, uh, there, and I think probably you could find the uh, same things for uh, North, North, Amer North America, is that people are not uncritical towards these ideologies and towards these processes that are actually, uh, that are actually uh, happening. Yeah? So whenever Facebook is changing its terms of use and privacy pol uh, policies, a lot of users feel very uncomfortable about it. So there is a kind of underlying sensibility where they feel something is wrong here, yeah? but uh, it's, not a co it's not politically completely developed. Yeah? Or especially in Europe, I mean, this has been probably more than in North America, already more politically organized because, for example, Google was facing big challenges by uh, privacy uh, groups uh, and data protection groups in Germany uh, and, uh, the, and, and in Europe in general. And there was also, uh, in, in, in Facebook was facing a complaint to the Irish data protection uh, a, 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 a agency, a agency. So I think in this, um, partly it's, it's everyday uh, expressions of Something is wrong there. Yeah, I think that's actually a sensibility that points towards uh, users questioning these ideologies. Yeah, so but uh, 
I think the way we should study ideology is because there, there's, a, there's a certain danger in, uh, in, in, in going into the argument that the Frankfurt School was uh, conceptualizing ideology as something monolithic uh, and there is, are also audiences who can be critical and they are, are, are active and so on and they can see behind, what, uh, behind the ideology. That's true yeah? and we must study it empirically and must also question, uh, ask, ask ourselves to which extent is it possible that there's a critical public discourse uh, about uh, the political dimensions of social media. I feel there's not enough, enough debate about, uh, in, in the public discourse, uh, discourse about it, so that's also in, uh, some, something that must be brought into the political domain, and especially the media have an uh, important role uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to play here. here. So just this, this morning I was watching television in the hotel, yeah? CBS 3, the news there, yeah? and I mean it's such crap news really, it's only commercialized really yeah and when they their, their tech section yeah uh, well they, uh, they, uh, they 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 were uh, they were covering social media in china yeah but it's not about the everyday sensibilities uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of 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 uh, of uh, of uh, of of the of the users it was about interviews with some ceos of chinese social media companies yeah so partly it's also a kind of celebratory discourse that i mean in the us then it's about silicon valley entrepreneurs ceos that are a lot in the media in the media and the everyday users they don't get a lot i mean and their sensibilities and also their what they think is great and what is not so great about social media it gets much less uh, att uh, att uh, att uh, att attention really. Yeah, so I'm not pessimistic that users are not able to question these ideologies. They do question uh, que uh, question them. The problem is, is already at the point of production that these ideologies uh, are being uh, produced and that massive budgets are being uh, are being uh, in, in, uh, in invested into su into uh, supporting uh, consultancy work uh, and uh, that, that produces this kind uh, of uh, of ideologies. So what I would what I would hope uh, is a, a, is a is a political economy of culture where the critical discourses are empowered really. Yeah? Uh, so where alternative media that report critically on these uh, uh, issues get more attention, get more funding, but unfortunately that's not, uh, that's, uh, that's not, that's not really uh, happening. And the alternatives, and maybe we can, because that's what your second, was your second question, the alternatives exist and there are possibilities to organize alternatives and we can generalize it not just from alternative social media but all sorts of alternative uh, media also in the realm of broadcasting and, new and newspapers. There are great things uh, happening uh, around uh, the world which happens in the cycles of activists in civil uh, society. But I think, I mean, there is a lot of, there are a lot of social movement and so uh, uh, studies of media, alternative media, uh, how the uh, social movements use the internet. Unfortunately, a lot of it is very celebratory. Yeah? Uh, I would also be critical there because it does not help the activist and many of these are people who are fascinated by the movements. Yeah? And somehow they are so fascinated by them because they support them politically that they are no longer able to ask critical questions when they study them. But it does not help the movements themselves when we only point out in our studies of social movement media uh, what the great potentials are and how activists manage to use social media, the internet, in a positive way. We must look at it from abroad, and I try to do this in my uh, study of the Occupy movement and how it uses social media. So if you look at what are also the limits, what are the contradictions, yeah? where do they struggle to get into the mainstream media, yeah? where are they framed uh, negatively, where do they face especially resource constraints, yeah? uh, where do they face inequalities uh, of attention and so on. And un unfortunately the history of alternative uh, media is also a history of voluntary precarious labor uh, where p people, because they are activists, yeah, exploit themselves without any payment uh, for the media activism uh, that they do, a very low uh, 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 payment. So I think we have we need media, media reforms also that can strengthen alternative media in uh, society. And maybe that's a good thing to show because I I deleted it from initially from my presentation, uh, but I put it onto an alternative slide. I think one idea for media reform would be probably it would in the North American context it would be more difficult, but in a European context, yeah, I mean, we we, uh, we have we have public service broadcasting in a lot of countries that is based on license fees, the BBC uh, and so on. I think this system could be further developed 
into a media fee, because the license fee, the BBC license fee, every household pays the same kind of amount, no matter which income uh, you have. I think it's 12 pounds uh, per month, uh, roughly, if I'm not uh, mistaken. But why does a poor person pay the same as a rich person? And companies, they don't pay any uh, kind of uh, license fee, so it could be reformed so that the media fee is a progressive fee. If you have a low income, you pay nothing, or if you have a, 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 a small organization, you pay nothing. If you have a large income, or if you're a large company with a, a lot of revenues, then you pay a higher media uh, fee. And what could then be done uh, is that the media fee, it, in, it should fund public service broadcasting and, or public service media, because we need them. And I, I think North America needs much more of it than we do in, uh, in, in Europe, although in Europe, public service media and broadcasting is also under attack. And of course, in, in Greece, as part of the uh, crisis, public service broadcasting well, was abolished in order to save, uh, to, uh, to, to save uh, money uh, as part of the austerity uh, measures. But I think we need more public uh, service media and more community-based media and alternative and civil society media. But the political economy point of it is these media activists, they need some form of uh, funding and here, because they produce alternative ideas and here the idea of, uh, of, uh, of how culture and economy play together comes in. Uh, it only works that, uh, that they, they need employees who work full time there. Yeah? Otherwise something like in, in, it's, uh, investigative journalism can also not I exist and strive if there is not someone paid for it uh, doing a full time job because I mean it's idealist to think that now we have the internet, everyone becomes a citizen journal, uh, journal, journalist and we publish investigative reports. It does not work this, this way. I mean, these, these citizens, they will not go to war zones and spend some uh, months there because someone needs to fund it. And where this money could come from is from if we have this media fee collected by, via the state, uh, via state power all, uh, also, it could be combined with the idea of participatory budgeting, yeah? which then would mean the state would redistribute the money and would, depend, I mean, uh, depends on how much uh, funding one w wants to redistribute and one must set the fees accordingly. Uh, and then via participatory budgeting, every citizen could get a check, uh, a citizen's uh, media check, uh, for, could be maybe a hundred dollars a year or any kind of uh, amount. Uh, and there are then two conditions. You cannot go and drink beer with this money that uh, you get via participatory uh, budgeting. Uh, it must be used for a donation. Yeah? Uh, so like Wikipedia gets donations, for example, and so on. It must be used for a donation and it must be given to a non-commercial, non-profit media uh, 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 project. Uh, and so you could combine participatory budgeting uh, and the idea of the, of the license fee and to further develop it and then the uh, alternative media would get more of a resource uh, base. And that's just one idea that needs to be combined with a lot of different ideas for media reform. It was a long answer. So, Christian, I now understand why you asked you want to take multiple questions first. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you, maybe could, be short, maybe yes. you could do that and then you could kind of use the last 10 or 15 yes, minutes to kind of respond. Yes, exactly. So, help yourself, yeah. Yes. Yes, thank you so much for this interesting uh, presentation. I'm not... Um, an expert on the political economy of, of social media, but um, social media is one of the things I certainly uh, study. And what I found to be most fascinating in your presentation is what is really masked or concealed behind you know, uh, the whole mechanism of producing uh, what we are using now as uh, social media tools. Uh, whether from the technological perspective, the labor that goes into you know, the production of these technologies, but most importantly, the meaning production processes that are also hidden and concealed behind this whole process of social media and new media. And when you said the whole thing about the uh, Facebook posts, you know, about the um, you know, camps and so on, what happened to Jewish people, and then all the likes, it reminded me of a student at the University of Maryland who did a whole PhD on what's in a like. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to give likes on Facebook? Because he discovered there's some kind of bandwagon mentality or mob mentality online where people just, simil you know, just uh, simply go and give likes, 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 without even understanding what they're liking and why they're liking it. I just wanted to know if some of your past research or future research will go into this dimension of meaning production, what is hidden behind these mechanisms of meaning production online. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Other questions? 
So I'd like to just add one, yeah. which is, um, and I think it's related to some of the points that Paul Beamer said about that, but uh, you talked about the relationship between physical labor and information labor um, within the cultural mm -hmm. work side of things. And then you later introduced the idea of, um, of ideological labor. I don't know if I have the term quite right. It feels to me like there is some purchase in this issue of how change occurs that depends on the relationship between uh, those three types of labor. And in particular, I'm interested in how information labor and ideological labor do and don't overlap. And so if you could just kind of speculate a little bit on, on that as well. Yes, that's good. I have a question. Um, and you point out quite correctly that the uh, Frankfurt School had the conception of ideology, which was a kind of a, a holistic uh, system. But we have now, I think, when you think of the various internet providers, yeah, they are capitalist organizations. That means they have an economy. But what is their ideology? I'm not so sure. Uh, I mean, part of it is actually to sustain themselves. So I would almost replace ideology with corporations or corporate structures. And they are, of course, capitalists in some form, but it's not the kind of capitalism that Marx wrote about. Because that was really uh, an organization of physical labor. Mm -hmm. And that is no longer the case. Um, this is, you, know, you say, ideological uh, work. And, and I'm not, I think this is like corporate maintenance or something like that. So. Yes, that question is just sort of builds on that. I'm going back to your suggestions for reforms, which I think are great ideas. Of course, you know, a number of people posited this idea of, of citizen uh, tax vouchers, similar to your uh, public sphere check. But you have to get beyond this kind of libertarian paradigm, especially in the, in the US context. So in terms of points of resistance, where do you see that happening in the ideological work? How, how can we get beyond the corporate libertarian paradigm that essentially prevents any of these, any discussion around any of these structural alternatives, these reforms to ever, to ever happen? Just to add to uh, the previous comment about the uh, what's in a like, and this, this post that you mentioned, and call it paradox, I think, in your presentation, which indicates that there might be more to be explored there. Do you think that these emergent understandings of what's in a like, <clears throat> understandings that are ne not necessarily in alignment with how these uh, modes of interaction were initially conceived, might complicate models of how ideology is maintained and reproduced. Uh, if people are developing their own understandings of how they're using and interacting with these media. Yes. Okay. That's a lot. So we we'll right. <laughs> try to, <laughs> yeah. try to answer to it. Yeah. Uh, so first, the, the likes and ideologies and how we, uh, how we empirically uh, study it. So I think it's... Uh, how I understand like the study of the internet and social media is on three levels. On the one hand, we need theoretical foundations, yeah, where I have worked a lot. Then we need empirical studies. Empirical studies always study uh, subjectivity, yeah? uh, human uh, subjectivity, with different forms uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, methods where I see the problem. And then we need ethics uh, and uh, political uh, implica implications that feed into social movements and political parties uh, and uh, so on. And I think all of this together combines critical social media and internet uh, studies. And I always try to work on all three uh, levels uh, really and my re uh, three research projects I've done were always about empirical studies so that we know more about the meanings that users give to the uh, platforms and that's also what others do so there's also a lot of uh, knowledge out there sometimes but sometimes I feel that the problem is really that sometimes that there, there are theoretical approaches uh, or ethical information ethical approaches without empirical research and then there's a lot of positivistic empirical research without theory really yeah because so there's a kind of division of problematic division of labor really yeah because if you want to all combine it 
Yeah, uh, then uh, you need immense resources for doing it. Yeah, uh, you need uh, research teams and research projects for doing it. But when I'm doing research projects, I always try to combine these three, uh, these three uh, levels. I think we are, so we already know more about what, how the users think about specific uh, topics. But on this other question, like the, the ideologies on part of uh, of uh, of companies uh, of how the advertising world thinks about it, how, uh, how, how regular companies think about social media uh, advertising, how consultants think about it. Not a lot of work has been uh, done, really. I think more work uh, would, be, uh, would be done. So I think uh, for an example study of what I would like to do, for example, in the future, and I would like to get funding for it also in, in the large project, is really to observe how the advertising industry uh, thinks uh, about it. Because they, I mean, they produce their ideologies, uh, it's partly books, it's partly uh, discourse, news discourse, discourses uh, in advertising uh, magazines. They have huge trade fairs where they invite uh, consultants. So there are good starting points for observing these kind uh, of, uh, of uh, ide ideologies. And I think in North America, more, much more has been done on it than, uh, than, uh, than, than, in, than, in, than, than in Europe. So in the European context, that's uh, really something uh, that, uh, that, should, uh, that where we should give more attention to. Uh, second question was about this question of how, to which extent does information labor and ideological uh, labor uh, over, overlap? And I, I had to do this very quickly, but I can go back to it, uh, where is it, was it just a table, or maybe I could even, so the question is also like uh, information work yeah, uh, is the kind of the, the cultural dimension, uh, no not the culture, the content dimension uh, of cultural uh, 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 work. And if we talk about digital media, then you in digital work, then that's just an organizational form of uh, of, of cultural work uh, as a uh, as, as as a whole. But I would like to split up somehow uh, this notion uh, of information into the qualities uh, of uh, of uh, information. So and we must see that wherever there is ideology, there's the on the one hand, I mean, if we if we use Gramsci as an as an uh, as, as theorist, then uh, he tells us that there's hegemony. So that there are people who are reproducing or not reproducing these uh, these uh, these ideologies. Yeah, but I mean, if you I mean, the Frankfurt School approach of ideology goes back to Georg Lukacs, and Georg Lukacs was was really looking at uh, at the at, at the structure and the production of ideologies. Then we need to get Gramsci in for looking at how there are relations and how people share ideologies. And then we need to get Stuart Hall in, who of course in encoding decoding model and so on was. Uh, was stressing these potentials of people, well, audiences, users, citizens, to question the the, uh, the, the ideologies. However, then the, I mean the, 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 the tricky point is how to define ideology and ideological work in the first instance. And in the theory of ideology, I mean there are these general where ideology means worldview, and uh, then there's the ideological critical approach where it means some form of distorted reality. And I define uh, ideology in the second sense, which uh, means uh, which means also a realistic uh, epistemological uh, uh, appro uh, approach that is underlying uh, it. But it's kind of a social constructionist at the same time because ideologies get constructed in social processes, and there's the there's the, uh, there's the possibility for deconstructing them, or like you are saying in your work, uh, Klaus, we can undo it yeah, and undo the, the power structures that are there. However, I, I mean, I think that the, that the relationships here between producers and reproducers uh, of ideologies or those who question it, I mean, it's a non-linear one also because the problematic approach is if we, if we would say there's a, an automatism when ideologies are produced, then everyone is manipulated by it, not, not necessarily, not automatically. And then the other extreme uh, would be a kind of relativism that, that says there's not a problem if there are ideologies because 
we can read them subversively. Yeah? There are potentials for uh, subversive readings. Yes, they are there, but how can we strengthen uh, uh, them and to which extent can they take part? So there's a kind of political economy in it. So I think that I mean, this division that there's an ideological work and critical work also means that uh, critique is the potential for questioning ideologies and both ideologies and critique are being produced under specific conditions and these are economic uh, conditions and, and this relates somehow to my conclusion about the alternative media that, I mean, because this table, it really looks like that uh, there's ideological work and there's critical work and both of them uh, exist, but we must take a look at the relationship between the two and then there's a power relationship there. Yeah? And I fear that in, uh, in, in, uh, in the way political economy works now, that this part uh, is much more developed and has more attention, power, money, resources, and this one has a precarious, uh, a precarious existence. So the, the political question is, how can we strengthen this whole, uh, this, uh, this whole realm? But nonetheless, I think they, they all produce a form of, of information, but of course information is not enough. We must look at the qualities of information. And Klaus' question uh, was, yeah, the internet service uh, pro providers, yes, they sustain the, some forms of of ideology, but out of economic necessity. Yeah, I think this was really also Marx's idea of uh, in chapter 1.4 of Capital Volume 1 of the commodity fetishism. That uh, it's not that, that there are ideologies, it does not come out of ideology as an autonomous realm. It comes out of the, uh, of the everyday realities within class societies. So I think that's really the materiality uh, of, ide of ideology uh, in, uh, in uh, itself. So I think Marx can help us to understand this. And then the, I mean, the, the form of capitalism has, of course, changed. Yeah? It would be a mistake, and there, but there are two extremes how people think about Marx. There on the one hand, people who say Marx is a 19th century thinker, and it's outdated. Yeah? So there's one book that is called Why Marx is Wrong. Yeah? Uh, so it's outdated, 19th century thought tells us nothing about the 21st century. Then there's, all, um, there's also sometimes an orthodox reading of Marx uh, that says, Nothing has changed. We still live in, uh, in uh, a capitalist society. So you can find this also in the discourses about the information society. Yeah? And those people who are completely opposed to it and say, no, it's capitalist society. Nothing has changed. To talk about information society, economy, is a pure ideology. I think, I mean, we need a kind of dialectic uh, here. That's the kind of Marxist dialectical and historical materialist methodology uh, applied to epistemology and the way we create knowledge about the world uh, itself. So uh, Marx's methodology is also that, 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 that there's a history of knowledge, which, also, and which has to do with the history of society. And if society uh, is, uh, is developing, yeah, then also our knowledge must change about it. Uh, but uh, at the same time, there's, so there's continuity and discontinuity. And in, uh, in, in, in capitalist society, I mean, capitalism develops also uh, in cycles of crisis. Yeah? I don't think these are long waves that take 50 years, as Schumpeter was uh, saying. But after crisis, normally there's some kind of, re of reconstruction and, and, and structures change. They don't change at the most fundamental level, but at another uh, more not so basic level of granularity that we can uh, look at, at the analysis. So somehow Marx also saw capitalism is dynamic and changing constantly. It constantly changes in this dynamic system in order to remain the same. So there's change all of the time so that there is some form of reproduction of the basic structures of, of capitalism. So if we apply this idea for an analysis uh, or that dynamic and dialectical idea and uh, historical, mm, yes, then it means that also capitalism is still the same and is different at the same time. So it has entered the stage of a knowledge or digital capitalism, which is one level. At the same time, there are still agricultural structures, industrial structures. They are not a way of the past. So Marx can, on the epistemological level, help us. And then there's also a lot of things that are overlooked sometimes about knowledge itself in Marx's works and what has been a lot discussed uh, is the so-called fragment of machines in the Grundrisse, where he talks about the general intellect, which is also something he takes up in, in capital, but it, uh, in a different uh, form. And by the general intellect, he means 
a status of capitalism where the development of technology results in an information economy. And where there are, when there is a general intellect, so he means this uh, form of, of work that produces information as a general property uh, of the economy and society, then this has an, uh, implications for the whole economy uh, and uh, society. So some, and of course in 19th century, I mean, when you, in capital volume one, two, three, if you look at his examples, it's all physical uh, labor. But one could also not say, I mean, uh, that uh, he described how the way the economy looked like. That's true. But at the same time, he was very anticipatory of how the future economy could look like. So just on an analytical level, he was thinking, oh, uh, companies need to, uh, to, Im to improve their, their productivity. If they need to improve the productivity, they need to, that needs to be technological and scientific progress. If there's technological and scientific progress, then uh, the, the factor of knowledge in production must become ever more important. So he saw the rise of knowledge work, and then also science must become more important in, 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 in society and the uh, economy. And I think we can build on these uh, ideas, and I think that's, uh, that the form, I mean, uh, I see myself probably as a kind of cultural Marxist or media Marxist, yeah? and I think in this kind of approaches that try to combine uh, Marx, the whole history of Marxist uh, theory and some ideas by Marx with a lot of, of other critical uh, approaches and in a dialogue with different forms of uh, critical uh, uh, theory, I think that's the way uh, forward and that's appropriate for a critical analysis, a critical theory and a critical political economy uh, of media communications the internet, digital, and social media in 21st century society. That's going to have to be a yes. Questions addressed. Um, feel free to talk to Christian afterwards. Uh, thank you very much, Christian. Thank you.